This is Think Big Show, and I'm your host, Mireille Lasula. Today, I have invited a couple with a big success story. Before I bring them to the studio, let's watch the video introduction about them. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Julie and Joe Foster, a couple who embody the spirit of thinking big, dedication, entrepreneurship, and community building. Joe Foster, the surviving founder of Rebook, needs no introduction. His journey from a young man born into a family business to a global business icon is a story of hard work, determination, and a never give up attitude. He has faced challenges head on turning in his vision into reality and has created a brand that is synonymous with excellence and innovation. His book Shoemaker is a testament to his experiences and is an inspiration for young entrepreneurs looking to make a mark in the world. Julie Foster is an entrepreneur in her own right, having worked in varied roles before becoming the managing director of J.W. Foster Heritage. She has been a step rebook instructor, operated a travel business, and assisted in the running of a country estate and nursery. Her role now involves protecting the history of Rebook, brand, and assisting startups and young entrepreneurs with advice and resources. Her involvement in philanthropy and community building through organizations like Let's Localize and also a proud member of Global Woman Club is a testament for her commitment to making a positive impact to the world. Together, Julie and Joe are a power couple who have traveled the world sharing their experiences and inspiring the next generation of entrepreneurs. Their commitment to community building, philanthropy and giving back is a true reflection of their character and is an inspiration to all of us. It's a great honor to have them with us today and we can't wait to hear more about their journey. Julie and Joe Foster, welcome. It's a great honor to have you here. And nice I know you've been traveling the world. Where are you hmm. guys are you coming from? And welcome back to London. Where are we coming from? Yes. Well, um, <clears throat> we could start with Australia a month ago. And uh, we came back uh, by Singapore. And the two days in Singapore, met some very nice people. <clears throat> then to Dubai, met some very nice people there. And then from there to Manchester, which made our trip three, seven hour journeys by air. These days, I used to be able to travel 24 hours on an airplane. Now, seven hours is enough for me, and then we have a rest. Wow. So, Australia, but if you want to go back further, we can give you a whole list, almost a, a global list of countries we've been to, from Canada to Norway to Iceland uh, to Panama. Yes. Well, we're we going move. to talk about a lot of these trips and the whole journey that you have taken uh, a big history and making mm. this big success with Rebook. But before we go there, um, uh, Julie, uh, you always travel together? Yes, always. We've always traveled together. You are together. the engine, yes? Yes. <laughs> yes. I am the engine room, the hard drive, the carrier of the bags. Yes, <laughs> I. Uh, we, we always travel together. Joe doesn't travel alone anymore. He used to travel. Um, while he was um, in his daily life at Reebok, he traveled many years all by himself. Um, and now he doesn't do that anymore. And how long have you been together, you guys? Do you remember that? Yeah, 32 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, it went up from there, yeah. It went 30 30 31, but 32 yeah. years. So Are you years sure? go by yeah. that quite fast. fast. <laughs> yeah. We're now 32 it years. It seems like yesterday, <laughs> yeah? yeah. Oh, it does indeed, yes. So what is your, I want to know both stories. Uh, if I ask you how, um, how did you meet and how, how, what is your your loving story that uh, uh, blowing moments when you met each other? What would be your version? My version, <coughs> well, my version is that uh, I had stepped back from Reebok, and in stepping back, I went offshore. I went to uh, Tenerife to, to rest, get some sunshine. But you know, you you've been in business, you don't rest. So I had about three little businesses. Not very interesting ones, but just three little businesses, very nice. One, one was in Tenerife, which connected with uh, the UK because we, it was a holiday business, so people from the UK were coming out. And uh, the UK, we had an office there in the UK, and they looked after the UK end of it, and Julie became part of that. And being part of that, she had to come out to Tenerife to have a look at what the business was that she was selling. <laughs> and uh, we met, and that was it. 
So you were not on holiday in Tel Aviv. You were no, working. I was working. I was already working for the company, but um, I worked in the UK, and Joel was obviously still in Tel Aviv until that that particular business became my job, my full time job. Uh, and uh, how is uh, how is the story of the beginning? I always love the beginnings, <laughs> and, and uh, even though it seems that uh, you know I've been spending some time with you guys now, especially in the last two days, and it feels like you're still dating <laughs> with each other. But uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about that um. beginning. Uh, it was quite slow, really, wasn't it? It was just sort of it, we just. I don't know, we just kind of fell into each other, really, didn't we? <laughs> it was well, just spending yeah. so much time together, I think. Yeah. With, the, with the job in Tenerife, uh, it meant sort of looking after properties. And on occasions, we had to turn out together because the person we expected to be there hadn't turned up, so we, had to, so we were doing domestic jobs together <coughs> out there, and we just enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and we just, just <coughs> grew into each other. So, Joe, how do you think... Um, Jo Julie coming into your life has that impacted the journey as an entrepreneur, as a business person, but also as a as a human being in your personal and professional journey. Well, I mean that's a big question. <coughs> <coughs> I could take you a thirty minutes just answering that question, but I, I think that when I step back from I have uh, enough time. <laughs> <laughs> you played your time. Yeah. <laughs> I think when we when I step back from uh, from Reebok. It was a question, okay, what do I do? Do I just enjoy life, do nothing? But you can't do nothing and enjoy life. So uh, I went to Tenerife to sort of get some sunshine, um, relax, and then I got into this little business. <laughs> and so it started and that was it. And uh, when Julie came out, I, I recognized the fact then that uh, we laughed a lot. And that has always been a passion for me, if you can enjoy, have fun. You have to have fun, and we had fun in, in Reebok, and, and this was, a, all of a sudden, I was having fun again. And you know, when you're having fun, that's a wonderful sort So you of don't like uh, complainers and dramas and dramas and people who create uh, challenges and difficulties. You are the person <laughs> who see, we don't see the problem, you see the solution, you see the opportunity, is that correct? Well, yes, I mean, going through Reebok, we could, and uh, in the book, Shoemaker, and go through an awful lot of those problems. Uh, I think in, in the first instance when you get a problem, when you're young and you think, oh, and our first instance was we needed to register our name. Jeff and myself, we set up our company and we called it Mercury. And our accountant said, after 18 months, you'd better register that name. And what? Why do you need to register the name? He told me. And that was it. Okay, so we need to register the name. And we tried to register the name, but it was already pre-registered. And uh, so we had to change our name. And that was our first big problem. Mm -hmm. And the answer to that is about 15 minutes long. But uh, we did change our name <laughs> and we became Reebok. But that was a problem. And after that, we had other problems. And we, we, we thought, well, instead of thinking, oh, what next? Why, why do we have these problems? It was like, just a minute. This is a challenge. Yeah. We've probably got the wrong name. We've probably got the wrong silhouette as it was. We had two, two stripes and a T-bar and added a subjected to that and said it infringed the three stripes. So we, we thought about it for 15 minutes thinking, no, no. We said, what's that letter? And we pinned that up on the wall. Mm. Great. What do we know now? We just change our silhouette. And we changed our name from Mercury to Reebok. That was better. Reebok was better. And the Reebok came from, I, um, oh. I, as I read your, your book, <laughs> and uh, you getting that, that award and, and getting that dictionary, it was like everything happens for a reason. Tell us a little bit about how did you, came, how did you come with the Reebok uh, uh, powerful brand? Well, we, uh, how did we come with the name? Yes. We came with the name because I've got to take you back to 1943. Anybody remember? We're in 20, that's 80 years ago. <laughs> I was a youngster of eight, and it was during the war. Everything like COVID, you stayed at home. And, but we had, we had some things at home, we had events, and I won a 60 yard race. I won it, and as you say, I went to pick up my award, which was a dictionary. I did complain, I said, where's the football? <laughs> I'm eight years old, what do I want the dictionary? It was a Webster's dictionary, which is an American dictionary. And as we all know, the American spelling on certain things are different. And uh, so I won that in 1943, but we fast forward now to 1960, 
we're sitting, we need to find a new name. Because the agent I've been to said, don't bring me one, bring me ten. How do you take ten, how do you invent ten names for, for the business that you hope will be, you know, your life, and that's it. However, we had uh, Cougar, that was a good name, yeah, and uh, we went through other things. And my dictionary was sat by me at the desk, so I, I like the letter R. I don't know why, but I like the letter R. So I open up my dictionary, my Webster's American Dictionary, at the letter R. And I start thumbing through, and very soon you come across E, E, R, W, E, R, W, E, B, O, K. What's that? It's a South African gazelle. Mm. A gazelle. We're a running company. Gazelle. Yes. That was it. Top of the list. So that's how we got our Reebok name, even though there was a caveat, and that was that the... Uh, uh, the registrar said, well, if anybody starts making shoes out of Reebok skin, we can't stop them. So they put us in the B section of the register. Ten years later, the registrar came back. We said, we moved you to the A section. I said, well, why is that? Well, now everybody knows that Reebok is actually a shoe. And unfortunately, the animal has to take second place now. Wow. So that was Reebok. Yeah, that was meant to be, and uh, it is the beginning of something big. Yeah. So, it, Julie, it looks like the whole life of Mr. Rebook is just rebook. Everything yeah. you talk just rebook uh, yeah. every, uh, in every conversation. <laughs> is rebook the main conversation between you? Um, no, not really. Not anymore. No, no, no. Since, since obviously, since writing the book and since the book came out, a lot of what we do, eighty percent of what we do, is involved mm. with with Reebok. It is, the Reebok is the topic of conversation. We do, Joe has been on over 200 podcasts, wow. um, various different interviews in many different places, radio stations, TV, and not in just in this country, in all over the world. So yes, the, for the last three years, it will be nearly, um, the main topic of conversation is definitely Reebok. <laughs> yeah. And uh, why do you think, um, like, uh, in the whole relationship, you're seeing like the engine. What is what is this concept of <laughs> the you engine being room. the engine <laughs> force, the power force well, for good? Can yeah. I answer that? <laughs> maybe yes. Maybe yeah. Yeah, you, you can answer, answer better. Answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am getting older. It's well, eight, I don't 80, see anything. Well, I've seen you running uh, today and yesterday. <laughs> you had more energy than me. <laughs> well, sitting down, I'm okay. But uh, now things are getting a bit uh, more difficult. <clears throat> we used to play tennis, but my mm. shoulder has gone, mm. this other shoulder has gone, so I can't lift now. Above here, I can't lift, so Julie's is all lifting. Uh, the engine room, yes, you know, I talk about uh, Reebok and I talk about Chariots of Fire, mm -hmm. which is a very famous film, and the three athletes, Harold, Harold, Harold. Abrams. That's it. The yeah, engine that's the them. engine. You start and she completes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the prompt. When he forgets that's things, it. I can just chip in from the side. You are I'm able to finish mm. his yeah. thinking. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's, right. that's love. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And you know, all, all the uh, inquiries that come in, Julie handles them. All our technology, Julie handles it. So I, Julie oh, has I, a solution for everything. That's right. I just turn up. Wow. Yeah. So um, <laughs> what, what I see here is that, first of all, uh, you you are not you are not the person that you get scared from the problems. You get the adrenaline from the problems mm -hmm. because that uh, kind of stimulates your thinking. And in the other side, you have been blessed having a partner, a wife like Julie, who's so not scared by the problems, but also is able to provide solutions and alternatives for the problem. Right. This looks like a fairy tale. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. loving this. It works. Okay, <laughs> great. But you start your book uh, saying that. Every success story starts with uh, a big challenge and uh, brings lots of sacrifices. So what sacrifices did you have to make to make this a big success? Well, I mean, some people call them sacrifices. I think, I think if you're an entrepreneur and you, you have a fixation, you want to do something, that's, there are challenges, yes. But uh, sacrifices, I didn't think I had sacrifices. I didn't think I sacrificed anything. Of course, I'm reminded by many people on other occasions, well, you're not here for this. In fact, we were in Australia, and my ex-son-in-law did remind me I was never at home. <laughs> and I said, well, yeah, so maybe. So did you have people telling you that you'll never succeed, you'll never be able to make it, or probably you're dreaming too big, or 
Uh, did well, you ever have these kind of challenges and, my and first how was wife, the reaction? Uh, Julie is mm -hmm. my second wife. My first wife in particular mm -hmm. used to tell me that. Mm. Why don't you go and get so a proper job? So you're a job? big dreamer. Yes, but why don't you go and get a proper job? And, you know, those are, that's not helping. Mm. <laughs> it's not helping, but we, yeah, we had the dream that, uh, well, you know, we didn't expect to be the world number one, which we eventually got to. Mm. Um, but we, we wanted to challenge the normal, the Adidas people, the, uh, the well, Nike people. There is no accident them. in life, and I don't think you got this success accidentally. So, so what kind of thoughts have you been entertaining in your mind that brought you? Because everything is a cause and effect. You're not here because you were lucky and something came and was handed over to you. Uh, somehow there there is some gift there is something special deep inside you that you had the power to recognize and honor it and say I take responsibility of that well I, I think it's probably persistence the um, whether it's an ability or whether it's a stupidity I don't know but just <laughs> never giving up no we can do this I uh, I recognize that the uh, business we were in sport and particularly athletics the big market was America we could do okay in the UK but the big market was America. So it's how do you get into America? And talking to the family, that's going to cost us too much. Mm -hmm. You know, the airfare across the, uh, a stand at the NSGA show, that's the National Sporting Goods of America mm -hmm. show, and that was in Chicago. A stand there, that, we can't do that. However, I'm reading a magazine. It wasn't Global Woman at the time. I think it was, <laughs> uh, I, I, it was Eurosport. And the government were advertising in there. And they, uh, they were advertising, we want you to export. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will pay for a, a stand, we'll pay for your return airfare to America, we'll pay for this stand at the NSGA show, and we'll pay half of your hotel bills and while you're there. But it was cheaper to go to America and stay at home. Wow. So you know what you're reminding said, no. me, Joe? Sorry I'm interrupting you. You're reminding me that uh, the fact that you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. The opportunities are available for everybody out there. True. That was available for everybody. But you had the power to see it. You had the ability to see it. And sometimes the ability to recognize the ability is the biggest ability that we have. So how, how do you explain that? You happen to be in the right time, in the right place, just seeing the sign. Was that a sign? Did you know that time was a sign? or? Well, I wasn't the only one that saw it because there were another 10 or 15 British companies joined us in America. Well, it, in a, only in 10 or 15, stand. but you were one of them, yeah? We were one of them, and we were, the, we were the only one that succeeded in finding a distributor. Wow. Out of all the uh, British companies. And it changed, because it, it took me 11 years. I, I, before I actually got a distributor in America, it took 11 years. And that's the persistence, that's the stupidity, yeah. that's the belief yeah. that, no, that's the market we need, we can do it, but we need a bit of luck. Mm -hmm. We need to keep trying, and um, most of all is you've got to have that credibility that you're producing a product that deserves to be on that market. So yes, it, it is. There's a lot of things together, and then we had the luck. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, Julie, do you believe in luck? Um, yes, yeah, and I also believe in, in. You need to see the luck. Yes, you can yeah. be lucky and not see it, but yeah. you need to be able. If you are lucky and you can see the luck then you can take advantage of it. And what are the main things that you consider yourself lucky? Um, I'm very lucky. I mean, I have, um, for 30 years, I've been with this guy. We've <laughs> had uh, so many adventures as a young girl that I never, would never have dreamed that, mm. you know, I would have. Um, I have a beautiful daughter, so I'm very lucky in that respect. She is uh, a very, very, she's hilarious. <laughs> she's <laughs> a funny girl. She lives in Thailand. Um, so yeah, I consider myself very lucky. And do you think that uh, you have the ability to attract that luck, to attract these opportunities? Because uh, the way also Joe speaks about you, it feels like uh, you have the joy, you have the positive energy, you have the source, you have this engine. And it feels like people are really happy to live around you, to, to spend some time with you because they want a bit of that. Uh, have you realized that you have that magic? Yeah, I am generally a positive person. I, <laughs> yeah, I don't let, I don't let anything um, get me down. I, and then if other people have got, you know, they have a problem or I'm the one that's there going, come on, <laughs> we, you know, yeah. we can do this and, and helping 
and giving them the positive messages, helping and supporting in Amazing. whichever way we can. And how did your life change um, uh, since you met Joe and how your life was before and uh, what are the changes that you started experiencing immediately after? I had a normal job <laughs> once in my life. <laughs> many, many years ago, I just had a normal job. I, was, um, I worked in retail when I first left school, um, which was not for me. It was, uh, even though I wasn't actually a, on the sales floor, re the retail environment was not really my thing. Um, so I didn't go back to retail when I'd had my daughter, Dominique. I decided that I would try something different. And I, I tried a few different things, but in the, this was in the, the mid 80s um, and I was alone. So I was a single parent and it wasn't so easy to find a job for mm -hmm. a, a single parent. They didn't look, you know, employment laws and, and, and yeah. opportunities, you know, equal opportunities were not such, um, such a, a, a powerful thing as they are now. Mm. Um, so it was quite difficult to get a job. So I had a few different jobs until I landed the job working in the Joe's office in the UK. Um, and then, since then, I've never had what you would call a normal job. <laughs> <laughs> so you I've never had a nine to five job <coughs> that has been stable. I have done so many different things and so many different so roles. So you're and working I just for Joe, but well. you heard about him. Uh, no, what? not really. You didn't, didn't even know no. about You even didn't no. know anything no. about no. him? Not really. I knew, mm. yeah, but because in 87, Reebok was only on its way up, really. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't, there was, I wasn't the sportiest of people when I was sort of between the ages of maybe leaving school and and my and after I'd had Dominique, I wasn't mm. the sport, so I wasn't really a trainer person. And th and in those days, still, you didn't wear trainers on the street. No. You only wore sneakers yeah. and trainers for sport yeah. or for exercise. You didn't go to work in trainers. That sort of thing was mm. coming, but it hadn't it hadn't really landed in the northwest of England when yeah. uh, when I was a youngster, as it were, or a young lady. So um, I didn't really know much about Reebok. It was like, oh yeah, Reebok. Oh. Hmm. I think I, I had a pair because I did go to an aerobics class mm -hmm. after Dominique was born, but it was, I didn't, uh, I didn't see it as a global brand that was huge in the world. It was like, oh yeah, I've got, I had a pair of those when <laughs> I went to aerobics. So I didn't really know that much about Joe. Mm. It's interesting, Joe, how women started bringing a big revolution in the whole fitness industry because it didn't exist before and I think women really played a big role on the success of Reebok, yeah? Is that correct? I would, I would probably say more than a big role. I mean, it was the role. Yes, Absolutely. The, the big <coughs> factor, yeah? <laughs> we, we got into America. We no need to go through that story, but it's, it's in the book, which is uh, quite a story how we got there. Uh, but two years, just over two years in, uh, uh, in America, doing nicely. And uh, there's a guy in California, he was a technical rep. He was also a good athlete. Um, and that's Arnold Martinez. You nearly jumped in there. I nearly did. <laughs> Arnold Martinez. <laughs> and wow. Arnold, his wife, was going to uh, these classes and coming back with her friends. And they were full of it. And Arnold saying, what are you doing? And he said, she said, we, we're doing aerobics. Mm -hmm. What on earth is that? Well, we're exercising to music. And we love it. Oh, he said, can I come down to your next class? Yeah, why not? He went But you had a class. plan in your mind or just... I didn't you... even know about this. Oh, right. I knew nothing. This, I Universe was guiding later. you there. Yeah. So, Arnold went down. He saw what was going on. 20, 30 women, an instructor, an instructor wearing a pair of sneakers. Half the class were in sneakers. The rest of the class, barefoot. No sneakers. And that's when he had a libel moment. Why don't we make a shoe specifically for women on a woman's last, in woman's sizes, and make it out of glove leather? You just came with this like bubble idea. He did. Sparkle. Oh, know. he did. Yeah, you know, you don't do things on your own. Right, of course, yes. You need a lot of good people. Mm, and now, he, let's talk about that. He was a good people, he was a good person. To build such a big brand, such a big success, an empire, of course, it, it has to involve people. You have yes. to be a leader. You have to, to inspire others. You have to be able to kind of bring your vision to other people's mind. Because if it is in your mind, how do you translate this to other people? Uh, how did you do it? You listen. You, you share. 
You don't, you just don't say, I am, you do this. No, you listen, you, you share. Because we, a lot of athletes used to come to us to, to buy the product out of the workshop and they would say, oh, can you do this or can you do that? So we would listen. Mm -hmm. And my brother, he was an athlete also. So we became part of the athletic community in the UK. Mm -hmm. And this meant that being part, you, we almost, we owned the athletic uh, business in the UK, yeah. even though it wasn't big enough. And it, you transfer that to America. And, you know, and when I got Paul Feynman in America, which was 11 years after we started, it was a matter of saying, okay, Paul, it's yours. And, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't want to go to America and tell the Americans what to do because the Americans are so good at telling themselves what oh, to do. Oh, yeah. They're pretty lousy at telling the rest of the world what to do. But they're very good in America. Mm -hmm. And so Paul was very good. So I'm standing back from America and I'm saying, OK, we'll give you all you want and all the assistance you want. But they know the market. Mm -hmm. And instead of me going over there to learn, no, I learned. And when you learn and you give, that's when you grow a team that feels part well, of as it. As they say, if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're the, in the wrong room. <laughs> the wrong but room, what I, I see yeah. here, though, you so the problem you were able to go observe listen learn identify your audience identify a problem and you s immediately you feel like i have the answer so the answer was with you but you were looking for people who needed that answer and then you provided them the solution rebook well rebook was there and rebook became a woman's company when when we started with the robics we were a nine million, nine million dollar business in running. But we're only small. That was a small part of running. So when aerobics came, <coughs> nobody knew Reebok as being a male, sweaty brand in America. All of a sudden, they knew it as a woman's brand. Nice, gorgeous, soft leather, beautiful. And so the women started to own Reebok. There were a few problems. You know, glove leather is not meant for shoes and we had to get through that and it was only at that point that I learned that we were making shoes out of glove leather and that uh, I'm saying what are you doing that for because they were falling apart but you know we're talking about Hollywood we're talking about Los Angeles we're talking about America they didn't care the girls didn't care they just went out and bought another pair but you couldn't take that into other parts of the world because mm. they wouldn't accept it mm. so I'm saying no you can't make them out of glove leather so because mm. it's too what did they do they aligned it with nylon. And I'm saying, just a minute, you aligned it with nylon, now you stopped it breathing. Mm. Because of the benefits of leather, yeah. it's nice and comfortable because it's soft and it breathes. Oh, so what did they do? They punched holes in the front and they got that, that way it, bre Innovation. it was breathing again. What I learned from that was marketing was mm. much, much, uh, much better than just manufacturing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's eighty percent is yeah. and marketing. Really the fuel, were, the yeah. engine. <laughs> and then in America, we were becoming a marketing brand, mm. and that was another piece of luck, a way to move. But there was no resistance from me. It was a matter of wow. Yeah. Okay. Look, we're selling five million per. We, wow. we start to sell five million pairs a month of uh, aerobic shoes, wow. and that's a lot of shoes. So I visualize here now. Uh, wow, this is somehow going bigger than you probably ever thought. So what, was it a moment where you felt like this is too scary? Like, as they say, if the dream doesn't scare you, it's not big enough. But did you have any moment uh, in this journey that made you feel like, hmm, I, I don't want to lose control? Because, you know, uh, when you grow a business like this, uh, it's your baby. Your baby is growing and suddenly you see that your baby is going out of your control now. Well, control wasn't a problem for me. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was growing the brand. Yeah. Or, these days it is scaling. 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 Yes. <laughs> you start there you and go. she completes. You <laughs> there's, there's my, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Scaling the brand. And so in order to scale the brand, there are one or two things you need. Number one is you need to find where you can get production. Number two is you need money. And in those days, we didn't have uh, VCs or anything like that. Money was not that easy to, uh, to you, you go to a bank and if you had enough collateral, that's it. So uh, for me, it was my, well, how do we get this? Paul Fireman, who was running America, who had the American company, he was the same. He had no money. 
<laughs> so be between us, we we no way of expanding this company and making it uh, making it grow in any way, or, or even scaling it. So uh, fortunately, he, he was Jewish, and he had a good connection, and that was a brilliant thing about the Jewish connection. And he had a connection, uh, I think it's called, uh, not Built Right, it was American something, a rubber company in America, who also knew Stephen Rubin. Stephen mm. Rubin is Pentland and is yep. JD Sports now. And Stephen Rubin had a business called ASCO, which is uh, associated shoe company, and they were, they were sourcing product out of the Far East. So that was the connection. He would source the product and give us a credit line. Uh, it nearly nearly brought him to tears when 20 million appeared as his debt wow. <laughs> because the product that we were taking. But that credit line was was the financing. Mm. That financed the brand. And fine, so you've got to give up something yeah. for that. Uh, but the brand grew. Yeah. You know, and people say to me, don't you regret that? And you say, well, you know, we were bigger than Adidas. We were yeah. bigger than Nike. We became, became number, number one. one. Yeah. What's to regret? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's it. And uh, you know, um, so many CEOs can come and go, presidents can come yeah. and go. They can't change a founder. Yeah, that's so true. That's a very powerful <laughs> so that's statement. My, that's my Absolutely. position. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And the, the future will change, but the, the beginning will never that's change. It. And can't um, change that's, history. That's incredible what you mm. have created, um, Joe. It's it's incredible. So, uh, is do you think uh, in the whole journey? Of course, uh, you know, building an empire like this, it takes like courage, persistence, and of course, it, you have to be able to take everything. Because in business, I have realized that it's not how smart you are, or um, how many skills you you gain, but it's how much can you take. And that means that um, the challenges, the obstacles. Uh, the small and big problems, everything that you have to deal every day, you just become master of it and you don't see uh, the problem, as I said, you see the solution, but also you become bigger than the problem. You uh, 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 kind of um, go beyond any problem because you are thinking big. So do you think you have done any mistake in this journey? Do I think I have? Any mistake. And how? Yeah, I probably how, made, how do you I, deal with I, I this? I probably made dozens of mistakes, but they're, they're part of your learning process. Um, when I was going into America, it took me 11 years to get in, and I had six failures. I had six attempts, six people trying to build them as a distributor, but that all six failed. Mm. And uh, at each time, I said, why? What was it? There's something we need. And we were trying to push into a market. We eventually got there because Runner's World was a magazine that was part of the revolution of um, running and athletics, and that revolution in America was just expanded. And Runner's World, they became so big, you, you think it was 350 million Americans, about 35 million that started running, and they were buying this book. And uh, Bob Anderson, who was the editor, in his, in his wisdom he decided he'd tell everybody which was the number one shoe. And it was Nike, mm. at that time, it was Nike. The problem is, about 10% of the 35 million, maybe 3.5 million, I want that shoe. Phil Knight couldn't deliver. <laughs> so the retail wow. trader getting annoyed because there's people coming in not wanting the product they've got and can't get the product they want. 12 months go by and uh, Bob Anderson decided, uh, we'll have another number one. And it wasn't Nike that time, it may have been New Balance or somebody else. It certainly wasn't Reebok. Same thing, they couldn't get the product. So uh, either somebody told him you shouldn't be doing that or he had another bright idea, but the third year he changed it to be in star ratings. And so if you could produce a five-star shoe, and there could be three or four or five-star shoes, that meant there was a better choice and that was great. That's when I knew we could make a five-star shoe. We were not in this business just twiddling our thumbs wondering what what was going on. We knew we could make a five-star shoe. That may be mm. a good hindsight statement. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, you, you had that feeling. And you were talking about those risks you take, what yes. you think you can do. Well, we didn't hesitate but think we could do a five-star shoe. Wow. And we did. In fact, we got three five-star shoes uh, in uh, 1979. Wow. We you think big and you get big. Wow. Yeah. 
And uh, Julie, obviously, I can see he's a risk taker. <laughs> so you know, I think you know uh, him more than anybody else in this world. So what are a few things that you can tell behind the scenes about Joe? Uh, things that probably, yeah, he never shared before. Uh, you never shared before. Yeah, <laughs> something that you can <laughs> share <careful>. with us. <laughs> Some s little secrets. Uh, well, he spends, a, now he spends a lot of time in front of a camera, in front of people being interviewed. And actually he's really shy. Oh, really? Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah, he's really okay. shy. Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, a big party is not the place for Joe. Mm. No. He's, so you uh, are really out of your comfort zone right now? No. Because no. you feel like you're in a mission no. when you share. And this you is Reebok. This is my story. Ah, oh, I yeah. see. This okay. is a possession. Anything for Reebok. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what else? Tell us more. Um, he's an, a fantastic architect. He, he, if he hadn't been um, done engineering at college or... <laughs> become a shoemaker and built Reebok, he would have been an architect. Mm. He has designed, we have had a couple of houses um, that have had to be stripped to nothing and Modified. start from scratch. Now tell us a little, bit, a little bit about that moment when you moved from a two bedroom apartment to a 20 bedroom house. Oh, the house, the, oh. the Silverdale yeah. Yeah. You, adventure. You, well. yeah. <laughs> you probably have some secrets about that as well. Well, we, we have, Joe had this property that was used as a commercial property. It wasn't a domestic house, although it was set up with bedrooms, um, ensuite bedrooms, because it was a training centre or it was a school. Um, and then the school left, um, so it was empty. And we went there because, of course, they'd moved out. We went to see it and it had been destroyed. It was just wrecked. Um, it was, you can't even imagine. There's, there was one wing and the, the, the door was, was, screwed, was shut screwed shut with yeah, bolts yeah. this big, m many of them. To cold. And inside this wing, there was four bedrooms in that one. Mm. Three or four. I'm four bedrooms, yeah. on, four ensuite bedrooms. Every single wall in every room and every bathroom had been sprayed with black, gra black mm. spray paint graffiti. Yeah. And, mm. and even they had, there was a pink toilet and it had wow. been covered in black uh, spray paint, just completely covered. And it was actually, it was, so the, the and mess. And you also didn't have heating. No, we, so, we had, so we stayed there for three years and, and fixed what we could fix with paintbrushes. And Joe is also really good with, um, good at DIY. Mm -hmm. He's very practical, great mm -hmm. woodwork, brilliant with electrics. Didn't blow us up once, <laughs> did you? A creator. Didn't blow us up once. Mm -hmm. um, and we stayed there for three years to put it back into shape. Mm -hmm. But we could, because of the, how the heating system was set up, we couldn't isolate the heating mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. rooms that we used. So we basically had no central heating and no running hot water oh, for wow. three years. Yeah. That's a sacrifice. We had an electric shower, but we mm -hmm. had, and we had a lot of, because it was so isolated, we, we mm. had a lot of security issues that ended up with us um, actually walking in on burglars in their property mm. and having to run. And mm, that's half of the secret. Lancashire Constabulary came out with their helicopter and their dogs. Wow. And, Oh, wow, that's yeah, looks that like was a an movie, yeah. Yeah, that was an adventure. It's a book in its own right, that one. <laughs> oh, there's plenty of there's plenty of stories uh, beyond of stories. beyond the Reebok story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Julie's going to write the You're next one. You're going to write your own book uh, now. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's yeah. telling me I have to write the to, the, yeah. the post Reebok. And then years. you moved again. How many houses have you been changing since you oh. have been together? Uh, oh God. Um, n nine. Around Maybe. the world? Yeah, we lived in, various in places. yeah, we've lived in Bolton, we've lived in Chorley in Lancashire, we lived uh, back in Bolton, we lived in Cannes, which is, well, Moujon, which is close to Cannes, Lausanne, and Tenerife, wow. and then back to Tenerife, and then back to France. England for the three years in Silverdale, and then we moved to France, mm. and then we left France. And now you are a citizen of? The world. Mm. <laughs> yes. Global citizen. But I heard you don't have a house anymore. No. no. You're homeless. Homeless. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. Live How in does it feel? Airbus. It feels like freedom, yeah? Yes. Yeah, we yeah. can just do what we like, go where we like, when we like. So why this choice? Um, well, it came up, it, it wasn't an actual sit down decision, <laughs> let's do this. It kind of happened because we, we decided that we were not in the right place in France. We loved it. It was a beautiful place and it was perfect for while COVID was on. But afterwards, there was just nothing to do. Mm. There were, so, and all through COVID and all 
since the book launch, people had been telling us, when the book is finished, we want you to come and do this. When the when COVID, sorry, when COVID is finished, come and do this. Come mm -hmm. here, come and speak at this. We're organizing this all after COVID. And you're traveling all the so, time. So mm -hmm. once, the, once we sold the house, it actually coincided with a couple of events that we had to, were, the, that were planned for London. Um, and then it just, really the floodgates just opened and we mm -hmm. just continued doing event after event after event. Um, and that was 19 months ago. Wow. <laughs> and we are, we've never, we've just not got round to settling down anywhere. Since. What an adventure. So we just keep going and we, we enjoy, but we've always loved to travel. Yes. We've always traveled and we always love to travel. So it's to, for us to travel is no hardship. Uh, before I go to the next question for Joe, um, can I ask you uh, if you can just kind of share with us some other moments of Joe? Have you ever seen him stressed or down or nervous or uh, scared or so? How is a man like Joe uh, in in a private life? He he's very level. He doesn't really get ruffled very very often. Um, I think one of the most stressful uh, times of the last couple of years was losing the little boy. Mm. Um, oh, the that dog. was um, mm. that was just horrific. <laughs> that was mm. that was a, a terrible few weeks, yeah. and yeah, mm. we still two years later, it's still. Did you see him cry? Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> we all cried yeah. for weeks mm. and weeks. It was just uh -huh. a disaster. We loved yeah. him so much. We, it's like sometimes you think, do you love him too much? Um, but yeah, we uh, that was that was a very difficult uh, time for us. That was a, a quite stressful as well because at the time, Joe had a really bad attack of sciatica, mm -hmm. and so he couldn't he couldn't do anything. And Peppy was in a hospital an hour away, and he, he, he Joe couldn't get in the car, so it was yeah. all it, the combination of things didn't help. It was mm -hmm. so that was a really a really rubbish time. And he, when he had COVID was um, a bit mm. stressful because we didn't know what was wrong with him and he didn't get better. Mm. Nobody knew it was COVID. So, and that was the most sick I've ever mm. seen him. Because, you know, generally we're both very, very healthy people. Yeah. We don't get ill. And, and no. he was so ill and that was, that was, uh, <laughs> and he and was, was like, what is wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> and what else would, would make you cry, Joe? Age. Age. <laughs> so you don't like aging? I mean, no, it's not that. When you grow older, things don't work the same. So this eye, quite waters. often, waters. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And, uh, so these, these sort of things happen. You know, this knee is a bit sore on occasions, and this hip is a new one. Mm. You know, things don't work as uh, well as they used to when... Uh, when oh, you're keeping very he, well. And he cries at movies. Oh, you do, oh, you cry oh, he's hopeless. I mean, I didn't used to, but now, oh. now I can get sentimental I about a, a book or a movie. Anything I can, even do. Even reading a, a book, I can get yeah, that yeah. way, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So you are emotional? Yes. But not highly strung. Okay, no. No. right. So, um, interesting. I mean, I could speak with you guys all day <laughs> long, but I know sh uh, time is, is short and, and you, you are traveling. I mean, you, you have a, <laughs> another flight to catch. So, um, I really don't want to close this conversation about tapping into another concept that I, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, we talk a lot in our community with Global Women. And, you know, it's a community with female founders, entrepreneurs. Yeah. Yeah. And their biggest, biggest concern, apart from building their confidence and believing in what they do, is raising money, raising capital, uh, being able to fund their business. And money is, is a big factor. But it, behind the scenes, we're talking about the money concept. And you mentioned that the money is not important for you, but... Uh, so money is very useful. Uh -huh. it, it gets you a lot of things. Right. But it wasn't the motivator. Um, for what it is, uh, I was motivated by we had business and it's growing. It's, we're scaling it and everything keeps on taking it up more and more. And it, it, it wasn't really to do my eye again, you see, it's, it's oh, the age. <laughs> yeah. um, and so really it was more a question of uh, what can we do? I mean, if, if you go out in life to make money, and now we go to universities, we, we actually talk to the MBA or the EMBA students, mm -hmm. and they start with, uh, what was your exit plan, Joe? Mm. Exit plan. So they are very technical. Yeah, they start with how yeah. they get out, and then they work back as to how you make it happen. But you didn't and have that? No, no. You're passionate. We, well, 
I mean, it, it is, read the book, guys, you know, read the book, and then you, you'll get more of the, the story put together. I can only give you snippets of it. But we left the family business because it was going down. Because we couldn't see any other way. We had to leave the business. So we left the business not with the idea of going to build the best company in the world, but we needed a living. We needed, we needed some money. We needed, you know, what do you do? Go out and get another job. We knew this job. So we set up to earn a living. So that was, that was the main reason we got into it. And uh, so when we go to these uh, well, questions and answers, and they ask various questions, of course, uh, it, it is more or less that, no, we, don't, we didn't organize the way that we get out of a company. We built a company. And, uh, okay, we have a lot of people who probably are, um, they've built four or five companies. They, they, they build it, they scale it, they sell it. Start again, they build it, scale it, the whole thing, and, and they sell it. But I, I just wonder what satisfaction they have. I love the idea of Reebok. <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's something that we did, we, it's, and I'm amazed that we were so successful. It's... It's not something that I told you so. It's not that. It's, it's, when, when I look around, and we look around all the time, well, I do, and see there's a pair of Reebok, there's a pair of Reebok, yeah. I was seeing more Reebok, I was seeing. And so it, it is a, I mean, in, in some ways, it's just something that sustains you. It sustains me because, you know, Reebok hasn't died, and, uh, I've talked to many people who say, no, Reebok's over now, it's finished. Yeah. No, it's not. It's just starting again. Yes. It's there. Does and it feel like a new chapter every that's time? That's right. And it has a lot of history. And there's so much about that history now we've got to talk about. And so many people want to mm. learn. We have a book, uh, and that's okay. And Julie's going to write his second book. And it won't, it, it'll be, Reebok will be in there. Because... You, we Always can't, will she be. can't go anywhere without yeah. me that, uh, talking Absolutely. about Reebok, and that's it. Mm. Uh, so, you know, what are, you know, what are your ambitions? How, how, do you, how do you make money? Well, Reebok made money. <laughs> One of the things it made money, which is, uh, is useful, yeah. but it's not the motivator. Yeah. If it was, I, I would probably be working at a bank or something like that, or sort yeah, that's powerful. And what would be your best advice to the young entrepreneurs, young people who have a big vision to achieve what you have achieved? Whatever, whatever you're in, know it all the way through from A to Z. Know the whole, know that business. That way you have a chance. And the other thing is, number one, have fun. Mm -hmm. And number two, have a lot more fun. <laughs> And number three, it really has to be fun. <laughs> Otherwise, you're, you're up against it. It's a big task if you're not yeah. enjoying it. So yeah. having fun is so important. Mm. And uh, the rest is knowing what you're talking about, knowing your business. Go in there and learn. or Don't learn it by uh, having to learn it. Learn it because you want to learn it. Yeah. Because it's, it's inside. This, it excites you. You know, you want to make that difference. And making a difference is an awful lot yeah. in, in, in any business. Making a difference is so important. Yeah. It only needs to be small. Reebok made a difference. They, went, they trusted women. Adidas, Nike, they stood back and said, no, mm. this is just a, a phase. It'll be over in no time. Well, in four years, Reebok went from 9 million to 900 million. Wow. And that was all to do with women. Yeah. So coming to... What can I say? Global women. <laughs> I mean, exactly. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. I think the idea is great. And yes, you know, Thank Reebok you. embraced women. Wow. And, uh, and that sort Thank of... Thank you for your papers. trust. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Big thank you for your trust. And Julie, um, what would be the message for young women who have a dream, entrepreneurial uh, women who um, look at you and both of you as great role models standing by each other and supporting each other. What will be your message? Um, again, just um, one of Joe's messages. It's a, it's a dual thing. Just don't ever give up. You know, don't look as, you know, failures are not failures. They're lessons to be learned. And then you learn from that lesson and you move on. And you just keep going. Just keep going. Yeah. 
Never give up. Never give up. That's Just right. keep Joe going. said, yeah, there will be people yeah. who tell you, no, 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 it's okay. not the way you should do it. Yes, you just and maybe don't they're right. Mm. It's well, they're you should right. listen. You should listen. Yes, maybe they're right. Mm. It doesn't work for them, but it works for you. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, Julie and Joe Foster, thank you so much for being my guests today. It has been a great pleasure. Your story is inspiring millions of people, and you definitely have made a big mark and big history to uh, this world. Thank you so much thank for everything. Thank you for well, inviting us. <laughs> yes, thank you for inviting us. It's and been I'm, amazing. <laughs> I'm sure you have a wonderful asset to get. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. This was Think Big Show, and I'll see you next time.